good night and good morning <laughs> to the rest of the people. Thank you so much on the organizer for inviting me to present this talk in the Sayana online seminar series. Today, I'm going to talk about my last work entitled, Are the extracellular vesicles a way to communicate among the cyanococcus cells? So extracellular vesicles are a small membrane-bound structure released by cells from all domains of life, including marine cyanobacteria. These vesicles are found at concentrations comparable to that of bacteria cells in the oceans, like 10 to 6 vesicles per milliliter or around 10 to 5 vesicles per milliliter, depending on the ocean, amid complex networks of interactions between microbes and their local environment. But how are vesicles formed? In gram-negative bacteria, there are two main routes. One is the explosive cell lysis, and the other is plebbing out the membrane from the cells. But it still remain unknown how the nucleic acid are inside of vesicles. Because when the vesicles are forming, they are taking many components with them. The DNA, RNA, metabolites, protein, lipids. But like I said, there is still unknown how nucleic acid are inside of these vesicles. Because if the outer membrane and in the inner membrane are bleb out simultaneously, so there is going to originate subcomplements that only from the cytosol. So this will explain the presence of the nucleic acid inside. But if there is only outer membrane vesicle, so there is not yet known how the nucleic acid is trespassing the inner membrane. So there is some gram-positive bacteria like Streptococcus that have some protein machinery that move this nucleic acid to the inside of the vesicles. The vesicles are hypothesized to play a variety of ecological roles in other bacteria, like biofilm formations, transport of small moleculars, nutrients exchange with other bacteria, feeding other phototrophs with vitamins, lipids, carbohydrates, gene transfer, and even host phage dynamics. But in Pleurococcus and Cyanococcus, it is still unknown the exact roles of these vesicles. And actually, these vesicles in cyanococcus were only observed in one extended culture by Steve Biller. So there are not experiments carried out still in cyanococcus. So there are many open questions. Because I'm going to start to talk about all these experiments in working with vesicles. I wanted to show you how we extract these vesicles in case that you want to do it in your lab. And in case that you are interested, and if you have any question, please contact me. I will be more than happy to help. So this is an article that we just published, Steve Villera, Paolo Oliveira, and I, with other authors in the Journal of Visualized Experiments. This is an overview of the cyanobacteria EV isolation and characterization. So there are different steps depending on the volume that you are working. There are different options for a small volume samples and for large volume samples to get vesicles. So there are five steps. The first is the cyanobacterial cultivation, obviously. The second is the separation of the cyanobacterial biomass from the small particle fraction. If it is a scenic culture and you check by sequencing and by TN that you don't have any viruses and other small particles there, so you assume that these small particles are the vesicle fraction. There are different options, like I said, small volume samples. You can just separate the cyanobacterial biomass by syringe filtration or vacuum filtrations. And for the large volume samples, in our case, working with cyanobacteria, with marine cyanobacteria, we use the capsule filtration. So, for example, for experiment that I'm going to show you today, the minimum that we get are 4 liter to 20 liter, depending on the experiment. The next step, we concentrate the vesicle sample. If you have a small volume samples, you can do it with an amicon column or you can use the tangential flow filtration. Like in my case, again, we use the large volume samples. The fourth step is the bicycle isolation and purification. Depending on the characterization that you are going to do next, you are going to purify it more or less depending on your work. In my case, I was working with the direct pelletin, so just ultra centrifuge and pelletin and then work with this and resuspend all these vesicles in this pellet. In the case that you want to clean to have a better gradient of your vesicles, you can do a density gradient with IDs and all solution or other kind of solutions. And then will be the characterization of the isolated vesicles by dynamic light, scattering or nano tracking analysis or by TEM, transmission electronic microscope or the hypopolar saccadized profile. So these are all these steps that I'm not going to explain in the rest of the experiment. So this is how we extract the vesicles. So like I said, we have so many open questions in cyanococcus that we don't know. 
the first question that we had was like, are all cyanococcus strain capable to produce vesicles? Because Steve Biller served in one axonic culture in 8102, but we don't know if the other cyanococcus strains were capable to produce vesicles and what is their shape, what is the size and how much is the concentration of these vesicles. So for that, I carry out a stay. Thanks to Steven Biller and Penny Tilson. I was working at the MIT for a few months and Steven Biller showed me all this vesicle war. So I was learning all this characterization of vesicles and all these techniques. So for that, we use Axenic Cyanococcus WH7803 and 8102. We did some replicates under continuous light and we were measuring every day for six days the flow cytometry analysis to measure the cell abundance, fluorescent and observance, and also the nano tracking analysis just to measure the concentration of the vesicles and the size of the vesicles. So this system, the nanotracking analysis, or we call it also nanosite. So this machine has the properties of both light scattering and also chromium motion to determine the concentration of the vesicles and also the size of these vesicles. So here you can see these are the particles and the cells per milliliter versus the time. Okay, so these are all the daily samples that we were sampling. This is for 7803 and this is for 8102. So these are the cells and these are the particles. Like I said before, these are the work done 0.2 micrometers because these cultures are axenic and we check it that we didn't have viruses inside of this culture. We assume that all these particles are coming from vesicles. Obviously, then we need to check by TEM. So we observed that the number of vesicles produced per cell per generation in the culture was almost the double in the 8102 strain. And also this number of vesicles was increasing with the growth of the cell. But when the cells are starting to die, there is a point that we are not measuring the vesicles because the cells, when lysis, these particles can be confused with the vesicles. So we cannot measure at that point the vesicles. Then, with the help of Dr. Rafael Lorenzo, that was working during postdoc at the MIT, helped me to observe these vesicles under the TEM. So we observed that the vesicle from cyanococcus measure between 50 to 200 nanometer diameter, depending on the strain. This is the negative staining. We concentrated the vesicles and then we cut it with the ultra microtone. These are the vesicles with the ultra thin section. And these are the results from the nanosite system. So we can see that the 78 or 3 measured around 50 nanometers. The 8102 had a higher size of these vesicles. So 8102 produced higher concentration, remember, higher number of vesicles per cells and also a bigger vesicles of the size. The second question was, are vesicles a mechanism for removing damage and repairable compounds from the cells? or to transfer resources to other cells. To figure out that, so Elisa Angulo, she's a PSE student that started last year and she carried out this light shock experiment. So she placed triplicates of 7803 and triplicates of 8102 under continuous light and another triplicate, she placed them under light shock more than 50 times the light that are usually grow this culture. And then for four hours, they were placed in this light shock. And then after these four hours, she placed them again under continuous light to see if the culture can recover. During all these days, again, we took samples for flow cytometry analysis, fluorescent and observance, and also nanosite system to measure the concentration and the size of the vesicles. So here, this is the growth curve for 8102 and 7803. So the yellow peel bar show the light shock. And obviously we observed that under the light shock, the number of the cells decreased under this light shock. But what is going on with the vesicles? Surprisingly, the number of vesicles under the light shock increased a lot. So actually the 8102 increased around approximately 5.3 times the vesicle concentration and in 78 or 3, 2.8 times the vesicle concentration. So this is the effect of the light shock. Remember when we are going to a strong vesicles, finally after ultra centrifuge, we are going to have a pellet. So you can see here the light shock and the control. We obtain a bigger pellet after the light shock. 
is orange in case that you are asking that because we are pelleting also carotenoids. We don't know if they are inside of vesicles or they are pelleting with vesicles. But this is nice for us because we can see where our vesicles pelleted. So when we are working with other strains like Prochlorococcus, this is invisible. So the carotenoids help a lot here. This is a video from the nanosite. This is the control. Okay. And these are the light shock experiments. So there are so many vesicles. Like I said before, after extract vesicles, we need to check by TEM that are vesicles, because if not, we can think that the light shock is killing the cells and all these are not vesicles and they are just like small particles that are from the lysis cells. So we went to the TEM and we observed many, many vesicles. So this is the light shock. The yellow arrow show all these vesicles. Actually, we cannot see too much the background because they were all touching each other. So, on a stress, we have a lot of vesicles there. But why? For that, we did a proteomic analysis of vesicle content to see if they have like a reportable components that they are releasing from the cells or they are just like a helper component to other cells. So we carry out a proteomic analysis with the help of Guadalupe Gomez Baena that is working in the same department at the University of Córdoba and she's the expert in this proteomic analysis. We are still studying all this and analyzing all these proteins because we got so many proteins. But what we observe is like a huge cargo of proteins involved in antioxidant function. So what we think is that the vesicles under an stress is releasing something that can be helpful for other cells, but are not unreportable compounds. Still, these are preliminary results and we need to continue checking all these proteins and all these modifications in the proteins, but this is what we observed preliminary. So the next question was, does nutrients limitation affect the vesiculation or the content of vesicles? For that, we did an experiment with different nutrients of starvation with phosphorus and also with nitrogen of starvation. We observed that the phosphorate starvation increased approximately 2.5 times the vesicles concentration. Again, you can see here the pellet and we also observed under the TEM. But curiously, the cells were not affected so much. We think that is because we pick one strain that is used to oligotrophic condition. So we are doing now experiments in another strains to see if the cells also change. But again, a stress condition is going to produce more vesicles. But what happened with the nitrogen starvation? So surprisingly, didn't happen the same. So the nitrogen starvation affected so much to the cell. In two days with nitrogen starvation, the culture started to die. But the point is we didn't observe a huge concentration of vesicle like we observed in the other stressor factors. So we think that the nitrogen starvation affects so much to the culture that maybe the culture doesn't have enough time to produce vesicles. This is what we think, or maybe because just the nitrogen is one of the principal components to make these vesicles. So this is what we are trying to figure out now. But to continue working with this nitrogen starvation, Another master student, Gonzalo, is doing this experiment that he had for culture. Two of them and the normal nutrients concentration, one of them with extracellular vesicle, another two culture with nitrogen starvation, and one of them plus EVs, okay, with extracellular vesicles. So these extracellular vesicles are coming from the same strain. So it's the Sinecococcus 702 that was grown until 20 liters, and Gonzalo extract to this pellet, and this pellet was just added to the different culture. He did already three experiments with this, adding the same amount of vesicles because we need to measure then in the nanosite how much vesicles we are adding. And I'm going to show you again other preliminary results, but this is actually what he observed after three experiments. So this is a zero time, so nothing happened, are all of them the same. But nitrogen starvation, you can see here that after 24 hours, it started to seem different after 48 hours, after 96 hours. So looks like with EVs, the culture grows much better and survive a little longer with EVs. After 144 hours, obviously with nitrogen starvation, we're dying totally, but still with EVs, the growth of this culture was much better. 
So looks like the own EVs of the cells of the same strain are helping each other, are helping other sister cells. We are working on these experiments. So what Gonzalo is doing right now, he's doing another extra more experiments and also is analyzing the TEM in each time because he sampled in each time for the TEM and also for the nanocyte to measure the concentration of vesicles in each time. The last question that we are trying to answer is how does vesiculation occur in cyanococcus? So for that, Rocío lópez Igual and Ignacio Luque from the Institute of Plant Biochemistry and Photosynthesis made this amazing plasmid that they have superfolder GFP, the fluorescent protein. They made this plasmid with the Rubisco promoter and they included a signal peptide to send this fluorescent protein to the periplasmic because we wanted to observe how vesicles are being yield from the cell. So with this plasmid, we later did the transformant in cyanococcus 70O2 and work it. We observed it under the fluorescent microscope and observed these cells with this periplasmic that we can see here, the superfolder GFP. But this signal was not strong enough to observe what happens with the vesicles. So next, they again design a beautiful plasmid, but now without a signal peptide and with a stronger promoter. Okay, so what we wanted now is to have recombinant stream of cyanococcus 70O2 expressing the superfolder GFP in the cytoplasm instead of the periplasm to see if we can much better observe something else. So I think that Rocio is on the public right now. There are some results that I got two days ago that they didn't show her yet. So I think that you are going to like it. So this worked. It. Actually, we did some videos how vesicle looks like they are being produced in from cells. And we are doing these experiments in different times with the fluorescent microscope. And we observe it that these vesicles are being produced from different parts of the cell. So not from one located site. The TEM, ultra thin sections, also help us to understand that. So we observe that there are a lot of imaginations that we think that are the vesicles that are being produced. So what is next? Rocío and Ignacio designed this beautiful plasmid to make these recombinant strains to have blue cyanococcus and also yellow cyanococcus, having the turquoise protein and also the M. venus fluorescent protein that are without periplasmic signal, so they are going to be in the cytoplasm. And again, this is something new, Rocío. I hope that you like it. We got the engineering strain of cyanococcus 70O2 expressing the venus, okay? So this is just the Venus, and this is with the chlorophyll plus Venus. This is like a combined picture with both fluorochrome. We have already some engineering also strains with turquoise, but we didn't have any picture yet. So we want to just mix this different recombinant strain with a different color to see if these vesicles from one of the strains can help other kind of strains. So the same that Gonzalo observed, that the vesicle from the same string can help other sister cells. So we want to try to observe that under the microscope. To conclude all these vesicles part, so the increase of irradiance drastically affect the production of vesicles in cyanococcus strains. The protein cargo is characterized by its antioxidant function. And our results suggest that vesicles are not removing damage and unrepairable compounds. Preliminary results showed that vesicles could transfer resources to other sister cells, helping them to survive for a longer period under stress. And the vesicle seems to appear around the membrane, not at a specific location. So these are the first part of the talk. Now I would like to show you some preliminary results that we hope that we can publish soon. When we did this ultra thin section of the cells to observe production of vesicles, we observe shapes of the cells that we thought at the beginning that was the methodology just to make these ultra thin sections. We observe it that there were like two cells link each other by something. Also, we observe a different size, like some of them were very small, another were bigger. The first thing that we thought is like maybe we have contaminated culture. So we ordered Axenic Culture from the MIT where we are collaborating. And they sent us different axonic culture. So we did again with axonic culture and we observed it the same. 
And these different morphological shapes remind us to the some alpha proteobacteria and also other eukaryotic cells that they have like a dimorphic cell cycle in which cell division produce two morphologically and physiologically distinct siblings. So, for example, in Calobacter, in Nephomonas, in Brucella, they call it asymmetric division. So, instead of having the typical symmetric division, like it is the binary fission, they also have the asymmetric division. So, they are going to have two cells that are morphologically and physiologically distant. Multiple alpha proteobacteria control their cell cycles in response to environmental conditions. And actually, there is a review that shows this phylogeny of isometric growth, and there are Sanecococcus elongatus that they also have these asymmetric growth patterns. So we observe it under the confocal and also by TEM under different stage of the growth. And we started to observe different shapes. So this is the typical asymmetric division in Ifomonas. So this is the cell that is forming an IFA that then is going to yield a new daughter. Then this new daughter has a flagello that this is going to be separated from the prostheses bacteria. And this is the swarmer cell. Okay, it's, they call it the swarmer cells because can swim and look for nutrients or for whatever. So this happens, the asymmetric division in Ifomonas. And what I'm going to show you today and I hope that you can help me with the question and everything, because this is something that we got new and we are working now. So what happened is in axenic cyanococcus, we found exactly the same. So we found exactly the same stages of this asymmetric division in cyanococcus. Again, axenic cyanococcus. This is in 78 or 3. They call it the prostheses or the stock in the other symmetric divisions. And this is what happened in another division, but apparently this is the new daughter. Okay. So this is their stock. This is the separating daughter cells. They call it warmer cell. And I said flagellum of Billy because in Cyanococcus, apparently they don't have genes for flagellum. So maybe this is the Pili that last year Olatha published it. Either we don't know what to call it, but this is something that we observe it. Actually, we observed it in 78 or 3, many motile cells. And we were looking into all these papers about symmetric divisions. And they said that this is a common feature from symmetric to asymmetric divisions is the production of daughter of different size. And this is something that we realized time ago, like why we have so many different size in cyanococcus and also in proterococcus. So we think that this is the typical division, the binary division, that one cell is going to divide into another cells, like exactly two daughter cells. And this is the asymmetric divisions that we propose in, in this work. We can see the difference in size between the, the one cells and the other cells. Also occur in 8102, like I show here, axenic 8102. This is in the recombinant cyanococcus species C7002. I said recombinant because it's grain under canamycin. So we know that there are not contaminants there. And we also observe it in axenic prochlorococcus. Definitely, we don't have any doubt that is happening. We are having asymmetric division that we don't know exactly how it works. So what we are doing now is other kind of experiments to check which are all these phases of this asymmetric division in this marine cyanobacteria. But how and why this complex cell cycle? So there are two hypotheses. One represents a bad head gene a strategy that enables as a population of cells colonize the local environment, whereas another subpopulation can search the surrounding for new nutrient sources, like especially useful in environmental niches that are characterized by rapid changes in nutrient availability, like the oligotrophic areas. And another advantage of asymmetric cell division is the differential aging of the two offspring, for example, may provide a sunset of the population with a fitness advantage under competitive growth condition. Still, we don't know, but we are doing all these experiments and we are observing also under the confocal. So we can see here, this is a picture from Ignacio Luque from Seville. We realize that there is a small daughter cell here that is growing. So this is the chlorophyll and the green one is the lipid stain. There are also other that we can observe here. The chlorophyll sometimes is in the stock, sometimes not. Actually, you cannot see in the bright field for the reason we think that we didn't realize before. 
it's very complicated to see. We also have videos of these squirmer cells because we can see the chlorophyll there. This is more picture, again, with the lipids stain, with the chlorophyll and the bright field. And now we are working with Professor Ana Bartual from the University of Cadiz that she has an amazing tool, imaging flow cytometry observation. So it's a flow cytometry that is attached to the microscope. So she can separate the cells of the different populations. So this is the cyanococcus, this is the heterotrophic bacteria, and she can observe, for example, here, the cells in the microscope. So this is the chlorophyll. What she is observing is that in these cells, these are not heterotrophic bacteria, they have chlorophyll, and also they are alive because she's using a CTOX screen, that the CTOX screen is a dye that is going to go inside the cell when the cell is damaged, when it's dying. So this is cyanococcus cells that we could select from the flow cytometry, and we can observe these prolongations, this prosthesis, like they call it. Okay, so just to finish, what is next? We are trying to get a mask that is this blue for this flow cytometry attached to the microscope that quantifies cells with this structure at population level. So what we want to know is a different stage of growth, measure the different structure that are in these cells, and also other possible future work can be used, like under the microscope, observe the, the FTSC rings to observe how the cell divisions under the microscope. So I think that these are the next experiment that we need to do to try to know more about this beautiful symmetric division. So just thanks to everyone to listen to me and the team, Jose Manuel Garcia Fernandez and Jesus Diaz de Apena that are uh, the supervisor. Elisa, actually, she's doing a lot of work that she's doing the PSC, Gonzalo, the master, and also all the tears on lab to give me the opportunity to learn all this basic work and especially Steve Biller. So thank you so much.